Welcome back to another episode of C-Mask, and we've got a reaction video for you today. This interview expresses many of the things that we talk about week to week in a way that I think you'll find very rich when we comment on it. So we're just going to jump straight in. Mike, Tim, I'll pause it every few minutes, and I just want to hear your thoughts about what you're hearing articulated, because it's so rare to find someone that resonates with the C-Mask message like we've got here we'll, with Dill Silva. Let's see what we get. In the rejection of Catholicism, we now have a, a, a hedonistic society that is not just the pagan culture of the past that was really receptive to the gospel 2,000 years ago, but now we have a culture that has actually built up an immunity to the gospel because it's based on the rejection of that gospel. So in short, it's an anti-Christic culture. And it's going to attack first, it's going to be antithetical to the church, and then secondly to the family. So we have a very, very hostile environment, um, and, and more hostile than ever in the history of the world. And so what an interesting point. What we're living through at the moment is an anti-Christian culture, and it's more hostile than a pre-Christian pagan culture would have been, because it's built up an immunity to the gospel and goes for the family in particular. Tim, you're nodding there. This sound good to you? Yeah, it does. I wonder, I've interviewed Dale, Dale Saver on my own, and I wonder how hip he is to the idea that it's not only pre-Christian, proto-Christian, but it's anti-Christian, yes. But also, I wonder if Dr. Del Saver understands, at this point anyway, 11 years into the Francis pontificate, that it's anti-Christian as a Trojan horse inside the city walls of uh, Catholicism. Now we have operators that have brought the outside, in the Zeno, in to Catholicism, and most all, most of all, they brought in feminism. So now it's like, it's a weird thing where the outside world hates us Catholics. The inside, the inside institutional Catholic world hates us, us Catholics that, that cling to the, the true gospel. And we're, we're pretty much hated all around, aside from a few fellow travelers like, and brothers like each other. Mike, what do you think of that? You're recent revert so it hasn't put you off but surely you must have seen that right some people see it and they think i i just can't revert i gotta stay outside the church but you didn't yeah i think the majority of people especially believers their hearts have been at least partially hardened by this 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 spiritual pride where there's a refusal to um, introspectively look at your own theological worldview and try to poke holes in it. And, you know, you see this, and I, I was this type of lapsed Catholic Protestant that had these preconceived ideas about Catholicism, and I kind of just wrote it off. Um, and that's why I don't really engage people in my comments, because they're simply not ready. And so you see a culture, not just within the faith itself, that's just hardened over by pride, and, you know, the, the root of all sin is pride. You see this as in the culture as a whole, even outside of uh, the faith, even within Protestant circles. Um, who was the quote? What was the, who said the quote? Uh, the smoke of the devil has entered the church. I'm loosely paraphrasing here, but I've, I've, I've heard that. I've heard... Paul the sixth there admitted it in 1971, shortly after he, he released the Novus Ordo Mise. He said, "From some secret place." Then he double dashed. No, I think I know where it's from. The smoke of Satan has entered the sanctuary. It's an odd thing for Paul the Sixth to say. Yeah, that's an interesting thing, and I've I've heard of uh, I've heard Francis sort of echo the same the same sentiment um, before, and I think to uh, Dill Saver's point, um, I think what's really interesting, and that's why I think you're seeing because I was trying to understand. I'm like, okay, so the Protestant Reformation happened in the 15th century, and then from there, downstream from that, it took quite a while for like feminism and liberalism and Protestantism to kind of like unravel. I guess you could say liberalism in this ultra left ideology started with Protestantism, because if you think you can sort of uh, rewrite the truth and make it somewhat subjective 
which is why there's like 30,000 different denominations, then from there you can make, you can make truth subjective in general. So you have feminism, you have liberalism. And I think you see this rapid decline now, especially in the last, let's say 20 years, because you see a culture that is enjoying like the vitality and the life of uh, Christian ethics, Catholic morality, you know, the perfect expression of natural law without regenerating that same life force that, that, that the faith has instilled in the culture as a whole. I hope that makes sense. Yeah, it makes sense. And I, I like what you're saying there about regeneration and the life force and the vitality, because he mentioned the attack on the family there. And Tim's always pointing out how the patriarchy is bifurcated between the domestic patriarchy and then the ecclesiastical patriarchy as well. So you've got both and the smoke of Satan entering the church. Well, that's it. It's going after both in the church and also in the family too, which is what feminism does. It's like an attack on two fronts. But I suppose the most important one is the one that Tim's pointed out there because the papacy is patriarchy and a, a fish rots from the head down. So the dream of the enemies of the church has always been to try to get from the head down what they want infiltrated. But infallibility and indefectibility mean that that can't possibly happen, which is what Tim was talking about with the finger hovering over the red button, but being unable to press it in some previous episodes. Right, Tim? Yeah. No, even when they get someone like Pope Francis the first into the sea of Peter, he can't do what perhaps he was in place there to do because of the charism of protection. That's it. See that by the statistics. Um, you know, there's been a great apostasy in the church. There's been a, um, and the decimation of the family, of course, is just, uh, you know, beyond anything that's happened in the past. You know, I, you know, I work a lot with, um, as a clinical psychologist, work with marital therapy in couples. And when I explain these principles and we get into it and someone's open to them, the woman sees that there's a harmony in this hierarchy. And that really what this does, not only does it call on men to be men, and it also celebrates the womanhood and the charism of the feminine, which is not appreciated in our culture. We see... So he's talking there about why the world needs patriarchy. It calls on men to be men, and it also benefits women and appreciates womanhood. He says that's not appreciated in our culture. But if you listen to most feminists, they will say that patriarchy doesn't appreciate womanhood and it's misogyny. Now, obviously, on CMASK, we say the opposite. We say that only patriarchy properly honors women. Feminism is actually a form of misogyny because it wants to treat women as if they are men. It holds them to a male model, a male standard. Send them out to work, for example. But what he's saying here about the family having reached a lower point in human history than ever before and why patriarchy is so sorely needed, that's what we're all about, right? Yeah, I, I love what Tim says about <clears throat> feminism being the original gender dysphoria, and that's that's exactly what it is. And it's um, the, the definition of patriarchy has been fundamentally rewritten and it's been like an indoctrination process through uh the um, brainwashing of women uh to, to influencing them to, to 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 behave and act and think like men and through the the assault on masculinity and uh uh the um I guess all the indulgences of, of, of modern culture, I think, you know, pornography, you know, and fast food and, and, and entertainment as a whole, even the way that men are depicted. I mean, if you kind of read between the lines, um, not only is it just, um, continuing that it, it's, 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 it's interesting because two things are happening at once. It's a continual brainwashing of women through media and all these other channels. And then it's just an all out assault on masculinity where men start to question themselves and, and even, you know, um, over identifying with their emotions it's this really interesting inversion where women become men and then men become women and as a result there is not that 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 patriarchal structure that allows a family and a woman to thrive i think that is you know patriarchy is like the protective container in which the uh, the sexes are most purely 
expressed from a um, image bearer, glory, glory glorified men being image bearers of God and uh, man glor glorified uh, women being made in the images of or the image of man. Right. Which is another way of saying that patriarchy is natural law because natural law is the divine signature in human nature. Nature generally is how the family is supposed to function. And given that marriage is ordered as a natural institution towards procreation and the rearing of children, it's children who suffer most of all when feminism infects the family because the husband, the wife, they can't do their proper duties. Tim, in your words, you said, yeah, yeah, I was Sorry, gonna ask, I thought you were just... why, why is it that patriarchy benefits women? Because, um, the, you said it perfectly earlier. Well, patriarchy uniquely glorifies woman qua woman. When they, the original gender dysphorists, the first wave feminists, reiterated what a woman is as actually the anti-woman. They, they just started saying when, the new definition of woman is those quidditative essential properties of masculinity that that constitutes gender dysphoria then all of a sudden the paradigm is inverted if starting in the late 1800s a woman is now a good woman is now basically what a good man does by looking at the top five characteristics of new woman then of course patriarchy which glorified the, the true definition of woman the opposite it is in direct contraposition to it so so it's it's pretty pretty clear what's going on here when you invert the de when you're a gender dysphoric and you say starting around 1850 around 1848 actually woman is this thing it's the opposite of what we always thought she was she's not passive she's active she's not receptive she's expressive she's not weak she's strong she's assertive well that's just a man and for the last 175 years, really, they're going to typify anyone that clings to the opposite, the true and the longstanding understanding of woman as hate, in, in, in hatred, in, you know, odium of women. And that's, that's I, I just don't think it could be much clearer what's going on. And Dill Saver gets that. Yep. Exactly. One of the few that does, which is why I wanted us to watch these clips together because it's so rare to find anyone else saying something similar. Yeah. The state intruding more and more in the family and almost has a carte blanche to do so, unfortunately. Um, and, but the reason for it, again, I think it's because we don't have the patriarchs, the men. Now, it's easy to point the finger at the bishops which you know thank god now and they are coming you know they're rallying against this mandate but we can see that they have not been as militant which i really think is a masculine aspect of the faith in that defense of that faith and now the chickens have come home to roost um but it's really not it's based their patriarchy is based on the family patriarchy they're men of our culture they're men that are raised in our families. And so it's ultimately a question of this Christian manhood and this not defending the faith and the family and the lack of that. Mm -hmm. So in calling men to defend the faith and the family, we're calling upon them to give their lives for that. Now for a husband, that means giving his life for his wife, for his family, being devoted to her and that devotion you know with a with a passion and you know what woman you know what wife you know wouldn't desire that you talk so when you raise boys to be weak and not make these really forthright stands for the faith and show a spine he's saying that you end up producing in the end church leaders bishops who also tend to hold back from a full-throated defense of it and it's like a vicious cycle because men then find the church less attractive what we want to do is actually make a strong stand for it in the family and in the church 
And the key result he wants is strong fathers. Because when you don't have a strong father in the family, then it's bad for the whole of society. And the government ends up having to step in as a substitute. The weaker the family, the stronger the state, which is why single motherhood, for example, didn't really result in the end of patriarchy. It just meant that the state stepped in and had single mothers in a kind of harem. Like, it's patriarchy or patriarchy. You don't get to choose anything else. It's the good kind or the bad kind. So that's really what feminists have to understand. Anything else is a fantasy. The choice is patriarchy or patriarchy. Mike, you were looking thoughtful there, talking about the fathers doing a bad job in the family, the bishops doing a bad job in the church, and the two being related. Yeah, I think, I mean, a lot of these issues come come down to the absconding father, which we continuously refer back to, you know, when there's no head of the home, the there's no direction for the body to go in. There's kind of no purpose. There's nothing holding it together. Um, and didn't, wasn't it, you guys would be able to answer this. Was it, was it Aristotle that said that the family is like the, the fundamental social cell of society? Who was it that said that? Yeah. And the Catholic catechism as well. I think you're quoting the catechism there, but Aristotle makes the same point. Yeah. 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 Aristotle yeah it's, it's, it, 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 go ahead, Tim. Sorry. He demurs from Plato very, I mean, he demurs from Plato everywhere and just shows how wrong Plato is. But specifically in politics books two and three, he, he's talking about the Republic book five, where Plato says that the child belongs to the state. Um, Aristotle says, no, the child belongs to the father. And um, a koinomia is family. And this is where the Catholic catechism gets the notion directly from politics book two and three that the family is the single cell of society and that the child belongs to the father and not to the state. So it is Aristotelian. Right. Yeah. Beautiful. Plato's and evil. I think, yeah, no, for sure. I, what I, <clears throat> this might be a separate tangent, but I think it's, it, it's relevant. This is why I think it's so important. The message that we're speaking in a world that I, I think, you know, on social media, people are so obsessed with apologetics versus living out the faith in a pure and honest way. And I think this is why, you're seeing more and more men walk away from the faith because from the surface level, um, it, it appears to be weak, right? They look at Francis, they look at um, some of these liberal things happening within the church. They see these men that are representatives of the faith and all they want to kind of argue about is, you know, really weak topics like sola scriptura instead of the fundamental topic of patriarchy because without that, that hierarchical structure, I mean, there is no Catholicism to begin with. And that was, again, you know, one of the major uh, reasons I reverted was because of that structure. But unfortunately, uh, most men aren't able to read between the lines there for whatever reason. Why do you guys think that is? If it was attracted to me, why aren't more, more, more guys seeing it? Like, what is, what, is the, what is the gap? What's the issue? I think you, you just have a natural <laughs> intelligence about masculinity. Mike, and I think you happen to listen to good content particularly well. And I don't quite understand why folks are so uh, cotton stuffed about the ears with this too, because it's, it's all natural law, like Will said earlier. I, it's, a, it's, it's a puzzling question why more folks aren't seeing it. It seems to be a, um, a stultification or a, um, a dia what is it, a diabolic deception some of the um, um, Fatima scholars use this term, a, a diabolic dissension, de, uh, deceit that has descended upon the land. And folks can't see really plain stuff. Men are men, women are women. I thought it was interesting in this clip, by the way, that Dill Saver makes a really good point. It is a bimodal patriarchy. There's clerical and lay, but actually ontologically, Ontological primacy belongs to lay patriarchy because where do all those clerics come from? They come from a lay mother and father. Great, great point. I always talk about the bifurcation of the patriarchy and I never really saw, oh, well, you have to give the edge. Even though the sacrament of holy orders is higher than matrimony, ontologically matrimony is prior because it, it involves a, a patriarchy that is um, 
pro-generative. I do think it's funny here that Dill Saver is trying to extol the bishops from however many years ago this is, over a decade old. He's saying they're, they're coming around, even though he, he had acknowledged earlier that there's an apostasy among the Episcopate. Uh, they're not coming around at all, uh, my guy. They're not coming around at all, if you, unless you're talking about four or five guys. So it's, it's a bit comical to hear this. And also it's a little comical to hear him talking about what woman wouldn't want a good man. Yeah, left her her own natural, properly ordered appetites, absolutely. But don't downplay. Dr. Dillsaver, you of all people should understand the absolutely informative role of culture, for good or for ill, in this case for ill. Culture can make people, like Mike, you, you asked, forget what they naturally ought to know or crave. And, and they have here. So a lot of women will say, I, I'm not I'm not interested in even a good man. You know, look at that article that was put out on Will earlier in the week that 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 shows exactly what we're talking about. So I don't know why he's puzzled there. Yeah, he, there's a, another comment I clipped here that will address that in a second. But to Mike's point about why people can't see this, I think you largely answered your own question before, Mike, when you said that pride has a big role to play because you are unusual compared to a lot of people in the you got the humility to actually be able to admit where you were wrong, to want to be under authority. And also you've got the mindset that you're willing to do hard stuff. And if you look at some of the responses from the Catholic moral theologians to the Reformation as it was unfolding, some of the sharper ones just said, I see what's going on here. You're offering the intellectuals the flattery of telling them that they are their own final theological authorities. They don't have to submit. They can just be DIY theologians. And you are also removing some hard things like confession and fasting. And yep. that's really appealing to the common people. So you've got something for the intellectuals appealing to the pride. And you've got something appealing to the non-intellectuals, basically effeminacy, not wanting to do stuff that's hard. And you're someone who's got humility, but also the masculinity to actually go ahead and do some of the hard stuff rather than try to run away from it. So you're a good fit for the full reality of Catholicism that some people deliberately don't want for those two reasons that actually appeal to you about it. I appreciate that. And I think what I've always been able to see is that if you're not placing your worship, um, you know, at the foot of the cross and the fullness of truth. Now that I understand it's, it's Catholicism, you're putting it somewhere else and you have to be careful about where you're putting it. And most people don't realize that, okay, well, if it's not God, you're, you're worshiping. If you're not, if it's not, if, if it's not well-ordered and within the church, um, it's placed somewhere else, whether you intend it on being there or not. Um, and I think you're seeing a big, a big, um, kneeling of a collective kneeling of at the altar of, of self and, and and the feelings of what makes somebody feel good. Cause I've always been like, I've always had an authority problem, you know, since I was a young kid, I always said, I'm either going to become a criminal or a business owner <laughs> because I don't, I don't, I never liked having a boss. I was quite a, actually a pain in the ass to most of the people that were uh, my superiors. Um, but there was something very natural about looking at this church and the structure and everything and, and having these guardrails that a lot of people, you know, will say, this is very stifling. I don't feel very free. Where for me, it was for some reason, the complete opposite. I know the boundaries that I have to stay within. And there's these process, this, this process within the sacrament of reconciliation to absolve myself without obviously, because we can we have to be careful. There can be abuse of sacraments as well. Where like, I know I'm going to sin. I'm just going to go to confession, which kind of renders it null and void. But there's this process, there's these rules, the catechism answers pretty much all the questions you could possibly want to ask about the faith. So if anything, I feel uh, the most free that I've ever had. Um, and as a result, all of my uh, carnal impulses are well ordered as a result as well, which I think is a very underrated talking point that I think a lot of young men need to hear, especially in this, you know, hyper pornographic indulgent culture. Mm, yeah, definitely. You got to get that under control concupiscence touch and taste in particular it's no coincidence that obesity and porn are two of the biggest um social crises around at the moment because they relate to both of those things touch mm -hmm. and taste Technical he's going to get onto a really interesting point in a second about the way in which um 
the playboy was used to advance feminism. Super important mm. point about men leading the way into feminism and it being a deliberate ploy to break the hearts of women. It's putting your family first, loving them more than you love yourself, loving your wife more than you love yourself, mm -hmm. loving Christ more than you love yourself. Yeah. I still I'm just going to disagree there. The, the order of charity actually goes God, self, spouse. You love your neighbor as yourself. So love of self is the standard for love of neighbor. I don't think he means it this way, but what he said there with ranking the wife above self, that easily veers off into the feminist happy wife, happy life. So 100%. Order of yeah. charity, God, self, wife. Yeah. Whenever you say that on social media, you get shrieking in the comments because you've hit a feminist nerve. They don't like to hear that. He's speaking to a female interviewer here, and what he's saying is music to her ears because it makes it sound like the whole page, whole point of patriarchy is um, putting the wife on a pedestal. It's really not that at all. The purpose of patriarchy um, is the the procreation and the rearing of children. The purpose of marriage, broadly speaking, is just patriarchy. And the procreation and rearing of the children requires the husband as the head. It's not just about serving the wife, which is a, a caricature of patriarchy that the red pill often uses. And it stems from comments like the one he just made. So that's why I wanted to point that out. Women, I say, you know, women, if you want to, you know, have a man that's going to be faithful and devoted to you and have a good marriage, just make sure he loves Christ the more he loves himself. He will always True. be there for you. He will give his life for you. And that's the key. And this is the constant process of this fatherhood, dying to self. And of course, that's a Christian journey in, in and of itself. But unfortunately, in our culture, you know, with the, uh, even with the dating and um, process, it's almost built into it to make a woman not trust a man. Mm -hmm. Because a woman gives her heart. She gives her heart to that man fully, completely. And you know, how many times can you break that heart mm -hmm. before they don't want to give it again? Mm -hmm. It's very interesting how the maternal heart like blossoms this. in a proper environment. Is that Tim? So I, I want to get my hair cut like this blonde interviewer lady. <laughs> <laughs> For next in a proper culture. Um, and if we look back to the time of, of our Lord's um, incarnation, we can see this is the fullness of time, a culture that produced the Blessed Mother. But in that culture, you know, a woman went from her father's home into her husband's home. She always trusted. She trusted her father. She trusted her husband. She could do that. She was never brutalized by the secular. She knew that man that she was going to marry was somebody that had already been approved and had the values of her own family. So, properly speaking then, it's this need for, um, as opposed to the dating um, we have, or the courtship, and of course the parents provide the reason and the ideals. Um, but you know, so much today, we, so often today, we don't have, you know, I deal with couples that don't have that background. And so we're trying to build this trust that is required for this hierarchy, for the harmony of hierarchy. And so what are they going to do? And, and oft times then the men themselves, of course, continue to not be trustworthy. Mm -hmm. If you want to repair this marriage, and it can be, and it can it come to great refutation, but the man has to undergo a true dying to self, a radical transformation, so he becomes a new man. And then you can trust him. So no matter what it is, if it's infidelity would have you, if that man undergoes a conversional process, then that will also call for his wife to go through one. And a new bond can be built. But it's that key is this exclusive devotion to one's wife which is part and parcel of her submission to her husband. Mm -hmm. Exclusive devotion. So again, if you have that exclusive devotion, there's no fear in submitting. You know, Western so I like two points there. He says that women have been brutalized by secular culture. 
They used to go from their father's homes to their husband's homes. Now there might be like a wasteland period of 10, sometimes 15 years where they're not under the protective authority of the father, but they're also not yet married and they're being continually mistreated by men acting out because women can often be chaotic without male leadership and direction. And then he says, what do you end up with? Basically, a damaged heart that finds it difficult to exist within a rightly ordered marriage if she ever even gets one. What are you thinking about that, Tim? Brutalized by the secular, by design. Well, don't go to college, as Dr. Michael Robillard and I wrote in what amounts to my fourth book. Don't go to college. It's a case for revolution. Unlike other revolutions, if young women stop going to college, and even most young men, then there will not be any longer this 10 to 15 year period you just identified as an interregnum between the father at home and the husband in the new home. This is the 10 year period. It's begun, initiated by going to college, often grad school and working a few years, getting real world experience. That's the bullshit period or more, more than that. That's the Luciferian period where women are losing their souls, having their tastes subverted, their natural appetites subverted, and them thinking they want to live out the sex in the city lifestyle. It's between 18, you graduate high school, you go away from home, you live it up. You're at college for usually six years at this point with a, a grad degree, and then you work three or four years or more in the workforce, and you are just living as a young woman the sex in the city lifestyle. If you don't go to college, this is my main moral argument in that book. Dr. Mike is making arguments more from his experience. My main argument in that book was about college has been used directly by the new world order and WEF types to keep young men and young women from procreating, marrying and procreating right outside of high school, which is the natural time to do so, which both of you guys did. And I, you know, I wasn't too far behind. I was 20, 24 when I got married. I think it's a very uh, G-A-Y point that this guy, there's something that just bothered me um, that I used to agree with. These poor girls are getting their hearts broken. And, uh, you know, I think in, I used to think that, yeah, you know, 100% of the responsibility is on the man. But I think women have more culpability in this, in this process as well. And, you know, well, I think you made this point that a, a, a young woman's mother has more of an effect on her, you know, her future in terms of her sexuality, how much she values that than her father, which then can be placed on, let's say a woman goes to college, the lack of leadership from her father in sort of steering her in the other direction. Um, would you guys say that there's more of an equal ownership of the responsibility here? Maybe if it's even 51% men, 49% women, but there's this whole idea that I used to buy into that. You know, if men just stepped up and led better, there wouldn't be this problem. But that's not true. I noticed that too, Mike. The way he was talking about submission there sounded like it could be interpreted as just uh, conditional. You know, un unless the man is Fabio, like you often joke, the woman is not going to submit. Whereas really, when you get married, you submit to your husband. No yep. husband is going to be perfect, but he still is owed that submission. I mean, that's all true. We're, we're clear about that. His broader point, though, which is that a man who is incompetent in all kinds of ways, maybe just taken outright alcoholic, for example, not doing his duties as a father, he's going to interfere with the hierarchy of the home and the harmony of it in the ways that Dilsever describes there, because he's going to lose a lot of that trust and confidence. So mm -hmm. leadership skills do matter, but the wife still owes submission. What you're talking about there, Mike, with mothers influencing the sexual behavior of daughters more than fathers too, is 100% true. You can look it up in all the secular scientific journals. I wonder whether some of that comes back to, however, the father not actually leading the wife well in the first place. So the you wife's might. dress is immodest. Some of her hobbies are. Maybe she's out drinking the whole time with girlfriends without him. So he is leading the household poorly there. Poor discipline for the wife. The daughters are watching. They see that. 
they think it must be valuable because mom's doing it and dad allows yeah. it. So there must be a point to it, right? So I do still think that male leadership matters there, but you're definitely right. The person that the girls learn femininity from is fundamentally the mother and it's her attitudes towards sex in particular that they adopt. Yeah, and I fully I fully agree with that. But like pretending that women are just like these poor little helpless oh, no. uh, sexual vic victims, it's like the listen, dude, like that's absolutely not true. I still think the majority of the 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 responsibility is on the man. Ab absolutely. Because if he's not keeping, you know, his 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 wife in check in those ways, and it, it falls on his shoulders. But women aren't these harmless little harpies that are just being brutalized. They're actively participating in it, unfortunately, too. Right. And it corporate hit, hit, or, or Sorry. Go, Tim. Corporate or generational culpability is famously difficult to parse by portion share, impossible to parse. Because, yes, the, these are women are fully grown adults, though without good leadership, they can act like children frequently. So, is that really the fully ego formed adult woman's fault that she's running around drinking or her husband's? Well, it really is both and. Right. So there's an important conceptual distinction between what you two guys are saying, Mike and Will, which I 100% agree with, and what Andrew Wilson calls, on the other hand, what about the Mendo, which is where anytime you point out, you, you break the first cardinal rule of feminism and <laughs> say some woman is doing something wrong, they just deflect by saying, what about the men, though? And it does sound like Dill Savers leaning into that point a little more than ours. I think if we had him as a fourth panelist today, instead of just using the clip, I think he would be saying, yeah, I, I've, I've, I know what you're saying. Over the last decade or so, I, I agree with you guys. The women are fully culpable, but their husbands are too. It's a, it's a both and. It's not an either For or. For sure. I yep. agree. Yeah which is how reality works because it's complex and nuanced. So we've got to give that full picture of it. And it works so well, this brutalization, for the reasons that Mike is pointing out, because both sexes enjoy it. Like that's mm -hmm. a dark red pill point that women do enjoy those years on a superficial level. They enjoy the promiscuity. Like how else did feminism get its hooks into them? It gives them all kinds of superficial pleasures. Otherwise, it wouldn't even be able to get off the ground. So, look, God blames and punishes both Eve and Adam. We don't play the blame game like feminism does, saying it's all men, or the red pill, saying it's all women. The truth is that both are involved. Both sexes fell together, and both have to rise together as well. But men are ultimately the leaders. And if you're sitting around waiting for a woman to fix your problems, you're making yourself passive and emasculated in a way that ultimately undermines you even more. The uh, extended adolescence that you refer to, um, it's narcissistic, it's egocentric, um, as is our culture. And it extends even past the 30s. Um, it can extend all the way through one's entire life as a man. Now this... The idea with adolescence, at the age of adolescence, that is the time to call the young man to these values of Christian patriarchy. So he's talking about rites of passage and how so many men just drift through their 30s even in an extended adolescence because they haven't been called to the values of Christian patriarchy when they were teenagers. So there needs to be a rite of passage, a threshold from boy to man that modern culture has lost and men are being damaged as a result. That young man has the same call that I do to be a man, to live out these fatherly values. And that hinges on, just like it did with St. Thomas Beckett, on the cause one espouses. So as they grow into maturity and the virility waxes and their strength and their ideals, it all has to be channeled, not toward themselves, not toward egocentric self-gratification, but toward serving a cause. And of course that cause is the faith in the family. It's a challenge for them at that young age. Mm -hmm. And so then from the, from the beginning, they're challenged toward that. And that's what manhood means. That's what this principle we call magnanimity. St. Thomas Beckett held it perfectly. He was a man then, and as we, we say in the book, 
G.K. Chesterton, a paraphrase, talks about him wearing the crimson and gold for the people. It's his office. He's there. He has to have authority. But underneath he wears a hair shirt. That is that self-abnegation, and yet, because he has a cause, and he, but he's, he's dedicated to it, and he's willing to champion it, and he gives his life to it. Now, those are the kind of men that a young woman should be attracted to and desire to be the head of her family. Mm -hmm. Magnificent. That kind of man isn't encouraged by our kind of culture, and everyone suffers as a result. You must know people who either feel like they never had that kind of rite of passage, that calling to manhood, and have some ideas about how you might do it for your own sons too. Right, Tim? Yeah, I don't really know anybody that had a rite of passage. Yeah, exactly. That was proper. I, I mean, it's not, oh, I can think of this guy or that guy that lacked it. I don't know many guys that had it. And I, I had a dad that um, led my mom really well. My, my parents are really, really close. But, I mean, so, and I've talked about that before. But generally, it was kind of restricted to my parents. I mean, it still formed a good example for me. My, my parents are really close and my dad is in charge and my mom was obedient but um something about baby boomers they didn't take seriously the idea of instruction and yeah you could do you can set a passive example and have a really good marriage the way my parents do but you have to teach like okay son i'm doing this because of that like it is like it you could just go build a fence and hope that you have the most observant son in the world who watches you build the fence but it's better if you're like, okay, I'm taking this and I'm putting this stake in first. This is like whatever the cornerstone stake. I, I evidently never built a fence, but I'm just imagining if, if you explain as you do it and you're explaining why you're doing what you're doing, it's 10 times better. And very few kids have that in yeah. our generation. I, uh, I, feel this, I feel this point deeply. Um, I think written on the hearts and our souls as and men and women is the desire uh, for children and in men the desire for, to to lead a family and i think that it, it starts as a seed in in a young boy's heart that a father is supposed to water and nurture into a, this 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 mature you know uh, um, uh, manifestation in his life in terms of behaviors and virtues and um, how he goes about um, behaving and acting upon the world i didn't have that you know i come from a long line of quote unquote, playboys. And what was really interesting about me now, to the glory of God, I have prodigal son tattooed on me for a reason, to the glory of God, looking back at this long, you know, um, promiscuous period that I had, that no matter how much I accomplished all of this, these things that my dad said I should do, or my uncle said I should do, or all these guys encouraged me to do, get this experience, get the sexual experience like out of your system when now I understand that you actually get it into your system. And it's actually very, very hard other than the grace of God to get it out of your system. Is that every time I'd engage in those things, there was this deep longing for just the one person that I could be dedicated to, for the children that we could raise up together. And I think what's really what's really fortunate, and again, glory to Christ for that, is that I had that little glimmer of awareness, that little bit inside me that was like, I'm actually a bit more of a romantic than I give myself credit for. Like, this, I'm not meant to do this. This is not something I'm supposed to do. And I just really wonder how many men that call themselves playboys or red, red pill guys or whatever have this deep longing that are just completely ignoring it. Because that, that was that, that's implanted on us as soon as we become a creation in our mother's womb. Firmly right. believe that. Yeah. And that's a that's a calling to a mission that is gonna unlock your manhood in a way that nothing else will, because that's what being a man involves, the potential for fatherhood. So it's the true test of man's character. So that's why you were craving that. It was greatness yeah. of spirit. And for a man, that greatness is very much tied to this cause. This is a specific masculine distinction. Women are very interpersonal. Um, a mother is concerned about her own, her family. That's the way it should be. But this going forth and this militancy and this cause is what a man defines himself as, you know, beyond the interpersonal, 
another aspect to that masculinity. What do I espouse? What can I promulgate? You know, what can I do? And so, in our culture, and this started way back, really in the 1920s, instead of having a noble cause, you know, be it country or faith or family, it started being these causes of, of games and play. And that's when we had the playboy come in to be, you know, that's F. Scott Fitzgerald's uh, mm -hmm. culture. Men started living for games, for entertainment. So, for an example, today, so if, you're, if, if after Mass um, you see a group of men talking passionately about something, what do you think it is? I think it's football. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. I get an A. Yeah, I get an A. They're, playing, they're talking about a, yeah, about a football game. Yeah. It's, there is their passion. But this game, it's not a battle between good and evil. What it is, is a distraction from the battle they should be engaged on. We're, the faith is being decimated. The family is being decimated. We're in very dark times. The battle's raging. Do we have time to talk about a football game? No. But see, men need to have a passion, and so they give themselves to these vicarious causes. But really, I don't have anything um, at stake. Mm -hmm. But the real battle is this battle between good and evil, between yeah. the church and the world. Right. Good restatement of why we talk about what we talk about on CMASK week after week, which is that the stakes are high, and the battle is, as Tim's put it at the start of this episode, not just church versus the world, but also within the church too. And there's a need for more and more voices to articulate the message of patriarchy, which is the true message of the church. But the world really wants to distract men from that because the world knows that this is important and high stakes. And the more we can entrap men in this infantile phase of being obsessed with games, and not focusing on what truly matters, the weaker we're going to make them, the weaker families are going to be, and the more ultimately the devil will win. So I really enjoyed the points he was making here for the most part, because we don't get many people aligned with the C-Mask message, but I thought he hit on a lot. And it's been good to hear the two of you flesh out some of the points that he went through. Yeah, which... yeah this is very Go ahead, Tim. <clears throat> Sorry. Sorry, we're having more of this this week. I, I just, I, he, it is, it's rare to hear a fellow traveler. And that's, that's why I interviewed him probably four and a half years back. I'm noticing more, I'm not trying to nitpick, but I am noticing more and more the conundrum that rightly Dr. Dill Saver is noting, hey, this is an end of the world, Sister Lucy of Fatima kind of prognosis. Things are really bad. You know, the attack on the family is sort of the alpha and the omega of Luc Lucifer, right? Mm -hmm. Adam and Eve being tricked to eat the apple. And, and now the, the final attack of Satan on the world will be on the family again. It's, it was sort of unspoken feminism before with Adam and Eve. And now it's expressive feminism the last 150 years. I just wonder, he's saying, look, it's the fight of our lives since we live in this 11th hour. I just wonder if, with him, if that would, or, or others that are kind of half acknowledging what we're acknowledging. He's maybe more than halfway there, but others only acknowledge about half of what we're saying. They're like, yeah, there is a crisis of manhood. But at the end of the world, if things are really dire, isn't it worth noting that it's both men falling short and women? Like, I just feel like there's an unspoken rule that people will do anything to avoid criticizing women. That's that first cardinal rule. And I, I just feel like there was, I don't think there was a word of criticism of women in this whole interview. I think, I think I 100% agree with you, Tim. I think most men, I get the impression from this guy here that he's well-meaning and well-intentioned. I, I, I think we, we need to acknowledge how good of a psyop feminism was and is um, because men don't realize that they're um, they're omitting this criticism of women um, either consciously or subconsciously to a certain level. Um, and so I agree with the overarching message that he's saying, 
but but I do agree that there's not nearly enough of this um, holding women to a similar level of accountability. Even though I'd say we 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 share more of the responsibility, being leaders, being the first creation of God. But it, it's such a successful psyop in the sense that we like hardly any of the men uh, mention it. And when they do, it's a pretty unpopular message. Hence why maybe our message is growing slowly. But I think what we're seeing now. We're seeing the pendulum swing, or it's at least starting to swing in the opposite direction because guys are kind of waking up and sitting up and saying, I mean, you're seeing this in a, like a mass wave of conversions and reversions to the faith. Yeah, I didn't try to time my reversion, right? But you saw Candace, you saw all these other people start to do it sort of in this like wave these this last year. So people are starting to wake up. They're starting to realize that like how deeply entrenched in our culture and these tentacles of feminism and liberalism and uh, I guess Luciferianism at large is really what it is, has it's been it's it's been puppeteering our thoughts in more ways than we even realize realize consciously right i agree Tim. I, I see it all the time in individual marriages as well when the husband is actually scared to confront and correct the wife it just makes yeah. things worse for the wife it makes him a weaker husband she sees he's a pushover and her behavior deteriorates more and more so it's not even doing your duty as a man to avoid criticizing women at all you have to call them out for how they fall short and correct them because that's actually how you love them. They actually, you're doing them a disservice by allowing them to do or say whatever they want. They actually want to be put in their place. <laughs> it's like a male fitness test. They don't, yeah, they want to be put in their place. They want you to say no and not give this elaborate, long-winded, holding of the hand speech as to why. Sometimes maybe that's that's necessary, but most of the time it's like, well, no, and that's it that's that's attractive that's actually that's safe why do women like the bad boy because the bad boy exists within his own frame he loves himself first he's not gonna kowtow or pussyfoot uh for her so men are thinking they're doing this good thing this noble thing by doing whatever the wife wants but really it's it's just a replaying of the garden in real time that destroys a marriage from the inside out and then mm. slowly the dead bedroom sets in they become roommates she hates him. He hates himself because he can't look himself in the mirror. And that's it. And it ruins it for the children. Everybody suffers. Yeah. I can remember being at school and I liked the teachers that were strict and kept order. You got good results with and didn't seem like they needed a friend. The teachers that were scared to correct classes and wanted to be pally with everyone. I just saw that as weak. Like, I'm a child. I don't want to be friends with you. That's weird. You should just do your job and teach me stuff. <laughs> it, 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 to to be uh to to crave to be liked as a leader is always a weakness and it applies within marriage as well being liked and being loved aren't the same thing and you can be good to your wife and sometimes that involves not being nice to her that like the guy who thinks he has to be the nice guy the whole time and never correct never be firm is going to bring chaos to the family thousand percent thousand yep. percent i couldn't agree more all right excellent well Thanks for going through this with me. I think it's been worthwhile for everyone. Let us know in the comments whether you think that Del Saver's points veer a bit towards feminism sometimes. We think overall he had some good points to make here, but we've clarified for, for you where we would just want to point out a little bit how they deviate from what we want to bring out on CMask. Thanks for watching, and God bless you too. See you next time. Nick's arriving at my house tomorrow. We might put up a special episode of me and Nick live in the living room. Love it. Love it. Yeah, Love should, it. Awesome. God bless you guys. We should all join in. We should, <laughs> me and yeah. should join in for that. Yeah. That'd be good. 100%. One all last right. thing before we jump off. I don't think we ever mentioned this enough. Like, comment, subscribe, guys. Subscribe. We want to grow yeah, this please message. Please subscribe. Share the, the greatest thing you could do. We're not going to charge you for anything unless you want to coach with us or do something that involves our businesses. We're never going to charge you for these episodes. We love doing it. Share it with somebody. Spread the message. God bless you guys and Deus Volt. Thanks, Mike. Take care. See you, Tim.